Hi, and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a great day so far and um, that I'm not about to spoil it for you with this rather gruesome tale of yore. Today, we're discussing Belle Gunness, who was a black widow serial killer from La Porte, Indiana, who over a period of 25 years in the late 19th, early 20th century, murdered at least 14 people. Some historians estimate her body count could be as high as 40. Many of the victims were newly arrived Norwegian immigrants, seduced by the promise of a Norwegian life on a farm not far from Chicago. Described as, and this is rather less than complimentary, a fat, heavy-featured woman with a big head covered with a mop of mud-coloured hair, small eyes, huge hands and arms, and a gross body supported by feet grotesquely small. She has some of the most descriptive names in the true crime genre. The Laporte Ghoul, the Indiana Ogress, Lady Bluebeard, and finally, Hell's Princess. She was born in the Norwegian town of Selbu in 1859, Brunhilde, Powell's daughter, Storset. She grew up on her parents' farm, so she milked cows, churned butter, wrangled animals, very much a active participant in daily farm life. But her family was very poor and her desire to rise up from poverty became a pathological need which ultimately influenced virtually every decision made in her life. After her crimes came to light, a newspaper from her hometown wrote Quote, that she was remembered by many as being a very bad human being, capricious and extremely malicious. She had unpretty habits, was always in the mood for dirty tricks. She was the scum of society. They didn't hold back, did they? Now, Belle was one of seven children and in around 1880, her sister Nellie emigrated to the USA and married an American man by the name of John Larson. After a few years, she invited Belle to join her. And when she arrived, Brunhild, Powell's daughter, Storset, Americanized her name and became Belle Peterson. The travel time from Norway to the USA had improved greatly. What was once a six month voyage could now be completed in around 10 days. But that's not to say it was a pleasant or straightforward trip. Meals on board the boat consisted of hard biscuits, rancid butter and salty herring soup. So disgusting that most of the passengers couldn't keep it down. And the bathroom arrangements, well, they all had to go to the toilet in literal shit holes where the faeces just piled up higher and higher as the journey continued. And despite the fact that the ships were all advertised as having dedicated cleaning crews, there was so much seasickness that vomit just covered all the surfaces of the decks on top. Having docked, Belle made her way to Chicago and started looking for work as a housekeeper. Initially, she helped her sister Nellie's family out with cooking and cleaning and sewing. But according to Nellie, all Belle seemed laser focused on was money. She wasn't interested in anyone either. Um, as far as potential husbands went, she only cared about how much money the man had and the standard of living he could potentially provide. Her first husband, Matt Sorensen, was a night watchman at the Mandel Brothers department store where he made $15 a week. They were married within a year of Belle's arrival in Chicago. Now, a whole decade went by before anything went awry. During this time, Belle was desperate to have a baby. And it was this struggle to conceive that drove a wedge between her and her sister Nellie who had already managed to pop out five kids by the turn of the century. Belle actually asked Nellie if she could just 
you know, have one of hers. As a compromise, Nellie allowed one of her daughters to stay with Belle for a while. But it became very unpleasant when she was collected because Belle was so passive aggressive and annoyed that the child couldn't just stay with her indefinitely. Her sister said, no, you can't just keep my four-year-old forever. And in response, Belle just cut off all contact with Nellie. However, by 1891, Belle had apparently come across a dying woman with an eight-month-old baby. And the woman supposedly put her infant, Jenny, into Belle's arms and made her swear to take care of the child. So she got her wish. In 1884, Belle and Mads bought a sweet shop in Chicago, a candy store. They sold cigarettes and groceries. After less than a year, a fire from a supposed exploding kerosene lamp burnt the place to the ground when only Belle and Jenny were in charge of the shop. Despite investigators finding no trace of glass, Belle convinced the insurance investigators about the exploding lamp story and was so rewarded with a large insurance payout. Now this was the first in a line of insurance fraud perpetrated by Bell over the years. But this was only the start of her nefarious activities. Before long, she had acquired four more children. They're like buses, you know, you wait a decade and then four fall into your lap at once. She did try to say, of course, that they were all biologically hers, but, I mean, something doesn't add up. Realistically, she would have needed to have had two consecutive sets of twins over the course of two years, having not been able to conceive for the 15 years prior. So anyway, now she's got five kids, none of which were hers, and it's said that she might have either stolen them or perhaps purchased them from desperate women, which was not unheard of at the time. Two of the babies died before they were six months old. The causes of death are unknown, but it must be said also that the infant mortality rate in the USA at that time was extremely high. After Mads was swindled out of the equivalent of $20,000 in today's money in a scam, Bell decided it was time to make some more money and they engineered another insurance payout by setting fire to part of their own house, having insured their belongings previously. But by 1900, after almost 20 years of marriage, Bell decided that it was time for Mads to go. He'd taken out a $20,000 insurance policy, which was set to expire on July 30th, 1900. But he'd also decided to switch to another policy provider with an increased sum of a $3,000 payout should he die. Consequently, there was just a one day window when these two policies overlapped and he was in effect covered by both. And it just so happened that on that day, July 30th, Mad Sorensen died. According to Bell, He'd come home that evening from his job with a fearful headache. And so Belle had given him some quinine powder and sent him to bed. When she checked on him later, he was dead. Her best explanation was that perhaps the pharmacist had messed up and given her not quinine powder, but morphine. When investigators asked to see the medicine or the medicine packet, Bell had conveniently already thrown it away. By simply stonewalling them and sticking to her story, the cause of death was declared as a cerebral hemorrhage and Bell was suddenly $7,000 richer. It's about $150,000 in today's money. Next, Bell responded to an advert in the Chicago Tribune by a man looking to sell his farm at La Porte, Indiana. Before long, she had bought and moved into the property. 
As mentioned at the top of the story, Belle was no stranger to hard physical labour. She was almost five feet eight, incredibly tall for a woman at that time, and well over 200 pounds. She could carry out pretty much any farm task alone. But she was also on the lookout for a new husband who could help her. And this husband came in the shape of Peter Gunness, a widower with two daughters who had recently lost his wife in childbirth. Within months of Peter marrying Belle and his family moving in on the Gunness farm, Peter's seven-month-old daughter died suddenly. The cause was oedema of the lungs. And sadly, within six months of his daughter's death, Peter Gunness would be dead too. On December 16th, 1901, neighbours were awoken by young Jenny Gunness knocking on their door. Now, according to her, her stepfather, Peter, had burned himself and needed help. But when the neighbours arrived back at the farm, what they actually found was Peter lying in a bloody heap on the floor with an obviously broken nose. They called the county coroner, one Dr. Bowell. Yes, Dr. Bowell. In addition to the broken nose, Peter also had a massive injury on the back of his head. Her Dr. Bowell immediately suspected foul play. But Belle managed to give a fairly convincing impression of a hysterical wife. She explained that as Peter was bending down, retrieving his shoes from the kitchen, the meat grinder somehow fell off the shelf above his head. The accident had also knocked over a basin of hot brine that had been simmering on the stove, burning him too. And she said, despite this, he had assured her that he was okay and had gone and laid down. You know, hours later, she discovered him dead on the floor. It was reported that she told these details in a completely unemotional fashion. And when asked by the coroner if she and Peter had had a happy marriage, she answered, as far as I know. And if you thought that was cold, her performance at his funeral was, you know, suspicious to say the least. It was noted that although she moaned and wailed at the appropriate times, and even had her face buried in her hands, she was also seen peeping through her fingers every so often to check whether people were noticing her performance. But in the end, there just wasn't enough evidence to suggest that the death was anything other than accidental. And it was noted as such. The next surprise was that only a couple of months after the funeral, Belle apparently gave birth to another baby. And this was a shock, as everyone who had seen Belle at the funeral had said she hadn't been visibly pregnant. But, you know, okay. However, when the midwife called on Belle only hours after the birth, she discovered the baby washed and dressed and Belle up and about doing chores. I know, different times. However, she was really puzzled when she called back the following day and found Belle busy chasing pigs around her farmyard. Also add to this the fact that the infant was remarkably large for a newborn and it was really suspicious, but nobody could prove otherwise. So it was just accepted. Thankfully, Peter Gunness's surviving daughter Swan Hilda was taken away by his brother and she was the only child to escape Belle's deadly clutches. Now Peter was gone, it was up to Belle to manage the farm again alone. As we know, she was suited to farm life. According to neighbours, she could lift and toss a 200 pound hog like it was a sack of laundry. After two years of working the farm alone, she decided that she'd actually like a little help and she put an ad in the local Norwegian speaking newspaper for a hired hand. 30 year old Norwegian immigrant Olaf Lindbo answered the advert and showed up in Laporte in 1904 with his life savings of $600.
No small amount, even in those days. He worked for Bell for two months and then wrote to his father in Norway, hinting that he might be about to get married soon. But in April, Bell went over to her neighbour's farm, Chris Christofferson, no, not that one, and told him that Olaf had suddenly left to go to the World's Fair in St. Louis. However, another report said that she told a different neighbour that he'd returned home to see the new King of Norway being crowned. She told Olaf's father that he'd simply packed up and gone west. Now, whatever the story, Olaf was never seen again. And Bell's murderous pattern was established. A few months later, Olaf was replaced by Henry Gerholt, who answered, again, a help-wanted ad. But within three months, Bell was back at Chris Christofferson's place, bitching that now Henry'd left for Chicago. These unreliable men, hey? The question is, how did Belle Gunnis murder her many victims? Traditionally, the most common weapon in the Black Widow's arsenal is poison. I suppose it's less noticeable and less messy, especially when one is running a husband-to-husband -husband scam. But later, judging from the bodies found on her property, Belle stabbed or chopped at least some of her victims to death face to face, taking them down in a whirlwind of horrifying rage. One victim's severed arm was covered in defensive wounds and a tuft of Belle's hair was found still clutched in his fist. After the murder of Henry Gerhardt, Belle changed tack, posting an ad in three different newspapers of the Midwest. The ad read, Comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in Laporte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided with a view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. She reportedly received up to 10 letters a day in response. And before long, Norwegian after Norwegian started arriving in Laporte with pocketfuls of cash looking for the widow Gunnis. It seemed that she was very convincing, taking great care to respond with every appropriate, i.e. rich suitor by letter, flirting with them and sending them a story of a potentially perfect life. Christian Hickman from Wisconsin sold his farm for $2,000. Emile Till of Osaka, Kansas, told his boss that he was leaving to marry a rich widow. And John Moe of Elbow Lake, Minnesota, withdrew $1,000 and told his bank teller it was going to good use in Laporte. Ola Budsberg of Iola, Wisconsin, left two adult sons behind, Matthias and Oscar, telling them that he was going to manage a farm. He confided in his brother, however, that he was really going to marry a rich widow. About a week later, Ola showed up at the bank in Iola with Belle Gunnis in tow. Sometimes, when they only arrived with half their money, she escorted them back to their bank and made sure they brought the rest. According to a cashier, Budsberg and Gunnis cashed a mortgage note. And when they left, that was the last time Ola was ever seen alive. A local farmhand at the time said that a different man arrived at the Gunnis homestead almost every week. And Belle introduced them all as her cousins. Most bought trunks full of belongings, but no one ever saw the cousins leave. And the trunks never left either, eventually piling up in one of Belle's rooms in the farmhouse. 
Now the question you're probably asking yourself is what had Bell done with all those bodies? Well, Polish immigrant William Brogiski said that he was hired in 1906 by Bell to dig a few holes in her hog pen six feet long by three feet wide and four feet deep. For what, you might ask? For rubbish disposal, of course. Brogiski said that he had no reason to doubt her. But we can all guess what, or rather who, was really going in there. And what's more, when they were discovered, the bodies weren't just neatly stacked. Bell had always treated each body the same, sawing off the head, arms and legs, before wrapping each part carefully in a burlap sack and then dumping the parts into each hole before covering them over with quicklime. In the autumn of 1906, Belle murdered her own adopted daughter, Jenny. Now We don't really know why she did it, but probably well, the most likely reason is that Jenny had realised what her mother was doing and it wasn't safe anymore for Belle to keep her around. And she was 16 at the time she disappeared. And it just goes to show that Belle had absolutely no qualms about treating the child she'd cared for for the last 16 years in exactly the same way as all her other victims. Jenny's dismembered remains were discovered later in one of the hog pits alongside the other bodies. There was one lucky escape someone that lived to tell the tale. And that was George Anderson from Missouri, said he came to the Gunnis' home and fell asleep in the guest bedroom on his first night, completely satisfied with the arrangement he'd found. No worries at all. But around midnight, he said he woke with a strange feeling and he saw Belle standing silently next to his bed, watching him sleep and with what he described as a sinister expression on her face. After a moment, she ran from the room. Anderson fled from the house the next morning, but kept the whole unsettling experience to himself. In 1907, Bell employed local farmhand Ray Lamphere to help with the chores. Known as, quote, the weak and worthless no-account son of a formerly prominent member of the Laporte community, end quote. Ray Lamphere was known to spend every penny he earned on drinking, gambling and purchased affection. Ray would have happily married Belle if that offer had been on the table, but it wasn't because A, Ray was local and Belle wasn't about to draw attention to herself by marrying and then disappearing a local man. B, he didn't have any money to steal. And C, he was useful. She needed to keep the farm in good working order to attract more and more suitors. And this didn't stop the two of them engaging in sexual relations, however. And inevitably, Ray's nose was often put out of joint when Belle was entertaining visitors to the farm. One of these final suitors was named Andrew Helgelin, whom Bell began to exchange letters with in 1907. By January 1908, Andrew had arrived in Laporte with a cheque for $2,900, his life savings. Mere days later, he and Gunnis appeared at her bank in Laporte and deposited the cheque. And then he vanished. It's believed that Bell murdered him the very same day as when Ray Lamphere returned from an errand that evening. Helgelian was already gone. When Andrew Helgelian's friends and family hadn't heard from him in two weeks, they started to get worried. But while Andrew, as per Bell's request, hadn't told anyone where he was going, there was a paper trail of evidence. Indeed. Family members found a pile of correspondence which detailed promises of land and love from a mysterious woman in Laporte, Indiana, named Belle Gunnis. Before long, his brother, 
Asla wrote to Bell asking where his brother was. She fobbed him off by replying that she would also like to know where Andrew had run off to. As far as she knew, he'd gone to Norway to visit his relatives. Asla wrote back saying he did not believe his brother would do that and that he was convinced he was still in Laporte. Calling his bluff, Bell countered that if he wanted to come and look for his brother, she would help him search, but added that organising a manhunt would be an expensive proposition and that she would need to be given appropriate financial compensation. Asla Helgelian said that he would come, but not until May, which bought Bell just a little time. Meanwhile, on February the 3rd, Bell's trusty farmhand, Ray Lamphere, either quit or was more likely fired and was swiftly replaced by a man named Joe Maxon. Over the next weeks, Ray embarked on a campaign of skulking around the Gunnis farm in an attempt to reclaim what he said were lost wages and to retrieve property he left behind. Finally, Bell got irritated and called up the local sheriff who had Ray arrested for trespassing, the fine for which at the time was one dollar. He did continue to be a nuisance, prompting Bell to go back to the local courthouse and file an affidavit claiming that Ray was insane. Despite her best efforts, he was pronounced sane and released. Although we don't really know the extent of what Ray knew about the goings-on at the Gunnis farm, it's safe to say he knew quite a bit. Bell was now fielding threats on several fronts. With this in mind, it's believed that she concocted her end plan and prepared to set the wheels in motion. In April 1908, Bell told the shopkeeper at a store that Ray Lamphere was perfectly capable of murdering Bell and her children before setting fire to her house which struck the shopkeeper as an oddly specific thing to say. The following day, Bell visited her lawyer and said the same thing again, adding that if anything was to happen to her, she would want her children, Myrtle, Lucy and Philip, to inherit her money. The lawyer found it especially strange as she failed to mention her fourth child, Jenny, who had gone to college in California several years previously. In the event that all of her children were somehow also to die, then her money should go instead to the Norwegian Children's Home of Chicago. After the meeting, Belle went shopping and came home with cakes, a toy train and two gallons of kerosene. In the early hours of the morning, her house burned down. Ray Lamphere was arrested almost immediately and when Asler Helgelian heard the news, he dropped everything and rushed to Indiana. The sheriff drove him straight to the Gunnis farm. By then, nearly a week had passed since the fire, and the skull of Bell Gunnis had yet to be found. Four bodies had been recovered, three children and one adult female. Strange, remarked the coroner, that the head of the adult was missing, especially since that made it that much harder to formally identify the corpse. Local papers suggested that vengeful Ray Lamphere must have done it, decapitated her and set fire to the house to cover the evidence of his crime. Before he left, Asla Helgelian was having a look around the farm and making inquiries when Joe Maxson happened to mention a couple of soft depressions in the ground in the hog pen he'd noticed in the spring. The men didn't have to investigate far before they uncovered the first of Bell's grisly surprises, barely covered by the fresh earth. Their shovels hit what was discovered to be a burlap sack, which when pulled out and inspected, was found to contain two hands, two feet and one head. Asla recognised immediately the withered, rotten face. It was his brother. 
when the men looked up, they realised with horror that there were dozens of slumped depressions in Belle Gunness's yard. The earth was filled with bags of torsos and hands, arms hacked off from the shoulders down. The scale of the atrocity quickly became apparent. On day one, five bodies were uncovered. On the second day, nine, and then eleven. After fourteen, the police stopped counting. Most of the remains couldn't be identified. As police soon pieced together, Bell Gunnis had lived a double life as a serial killer. The papers pounced on the story. A week after calling her a heroine for trying to save her children in a tragic house fire, she was now nicknamed the Indiana Ogress, the female Bluebeard. Crowds were drawn to the infamous property and waited patiently for hours on end with morbid fascination, keen to see body parts yanked from the dirt. Vendors even sold ice cream and popcorn to onlookers and something called Gunnis Stew, which sounds extremely unsavoury. It didn't take long for it to dawn on investigators that the identity of the headless woman in Gunnis's basement was a matter of public safety. If the body didn't belong to Gunnis and weighing close to 160 pounds, as opposed to Bell's much taller, much sturdier frame, it was unlikely, then it meant that a serial killer was on the loose. Because of the crude recovery methods, the precise number of bodies is unknown. Suffice to say that it was at least 12, including the bodies of Helgelian and Bell's daughter, Jenny, who are both now buried in Patton Cemetery near Peter Gunnis. With Bell presumed either dead or more likely missing, the trial of Ray Lamphere became the focus. Was he Bell's accomplice? Just how much had he known? At trial, Lamphere was actually acquitted of murder, but found guilty of arson and sentenced to 20 years in the state prison. A year later, he died aged 39, of tuberculosis. However, after his death, the Reverend E. A. Shell produced a deathbed confession that Ray had made. And he said that he had never murdered anyone, but that he had helped Belle bury many of her victims. He explained that when a victim arrived at the farm, Belle made him feel comfortable, cooked him a substantial meal, she then drugged his coffee, often with strychnine. And while the man was incapacitated, she split his head open with a meat chopper or an axe. Sometimes they were sleeping when she attacked them. She would then carry the body to the basement and dissect it before burying it in the hog pens. Ray also stated that the headless female corpse discovered in the house fire was more than likely a woman Bell had lured from Chicago and engaged as a housekeeper only days before. After murdering the woman and removing her head, which he said she weighted down and threw into a nearby swamp, she dressed the body in her clothes, removed her own false teeth and placed them beside the body, hoping that this would convince people of her identity. Lamphere had helped her he admitted, but instead of keeping her word and joining up with him to go on the run, she ditched him and gone it alone. By his estimation, Gunnis had murdered 42 men and probably accumulated over $250,000 over the years. In the days before she disappeared, she had withdrawn almost all her savings the fact that many said emphasised her decision to fake her death and run. So what happened to her? There were unsubstantiated sightings of the widow Gunnis for decades. For 20 years, the Laporte Sheriff said he received, on average, two reports a month. But since the fire, Belle's true fate remains unknown. She's transcended into American criminal folklore, a female bluebeard. 
So in conclusion, is it possible the undertaker made a mistake and the body found in the fire was Bell? Yes. Is it possible Ray Lamphere had more involvement in the whole thing than we know about? Also yes. Is it possible that Bell Gun is just got away? Yes. Basically, it's impossible that we will ever discover the whole truth. For better or for worse, what happened to Bell will probably always remain one of the 20th century's greatest mysteries. That's it. Wow, what a whirlwind she was. <laughs> if you enjoyed hearing about this case, do me a favor and leave a like or a comment. I'd love to hear your theory about what happened to Belle. Also, if you haven't already, please take just a second to hit the subscribe button. I'd be so grateful. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.